Next, we're going to talk about how to make the right app. So as app developers, how do you figure out how to, how to make the right app? And how do you make the app right? And how do you make it launch? So this is what this session is about. And um, please give a warm welcome to, to our speakers. <laughs> Thanks, Chai. Can everyone hear me? OK, all right, great. Um, thanks for letting me be here, um, Chai, and thanks to Tim for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here at my first Renaissance I.O. Um, today, I want to talk about designing for the right audience. And uh, it's kind of hard to follow Michael Mace. He's great. That's the second time I've seen that talk, and it was just as interesting the second time as it was the first time. So. OK. Just a little bit about me. Uh, this is, was my first Macintosh model. And I bought it in college. And I loved it from the second I got it home. And I've used a Mac for several hours a day, pretty much every day since that day. And um, it inspired me to get into user experience. And what I wanted to provide to people through my work in the field was um, letting other people be as productive with their technology as it had let me be productive. So I, I could just get so much done with it, and I always loved that. And that's what I've tried to do throughout my work. Um, and recently, um, Tim tweeted this. And this was, he tweeted this, Plaid is the new flat, on the day that Apple announced that the um, head of Burberry would be coming to head Apple's retail operations. <laughs> And it really cracked me up, but it also gave me pause, because I've, I've been hearing comments from um, experts in the industry, from people like John Maeda at KPCB. And he said, indeed, the tech industry sometimes seems about to merge with the fashion industry. And then um, Julie Zhuo from Facebook made a post on Medium a couple months ago about the furor over flat design in mobile, and uh, can we please go back to solving real problems? not worrying so much about the style of the user interfaces. So I wanted to tell you a story about the extent to which this um, kind of tug of war between functionality and style has come, has come to pass. So two years ago, I went to work uh, at a little company in Sunnyvale. I won't tell you which one. Um, it was ramping up the UX team after uh, it had been slashed during an acquisition. So it was down to two UI designers where there had been five or six before. And this company makes um, B2C software. So it sells to IT administrators who, in turn, let their end users get uh, secure mobile enterprise data on uh, Android, iOS, and Windows phones. So for example, you can get your email, calendar contacts, tasks, um, documents. They make a, um, a chat app, a file sharing app. Um, and uh, you can take this anywhere you go and not worry about your data being stolen. It's all encrypted and et cetera. And when it's uh, pr also primarily targeted to uh, salespeople and executives, so people who are on the go a lot who have very sensitive data on their devices. And when I started, um, the app had one and a half stars in, in iTunes. Uh, but we had lots of data about what the users didn't like about the app, all kinds of features that they felt were missing, um, features that they didn't feel were designed that well. And so we were all really excited. And we thought, great, we've got all this information to go on. We know exactly what we need to do. And we're going to turn this into a four or a five star app. Let's roll up our sleeves, take our new team, and get to work. And so we kind of dove into this maelstrom. Um, and there were all the usual challenges, you know, um, vague customer requests, disagreements among and within the um, product management team, the UX team, the development team, the QA team. But we all worked really hard, and um, we're ready to, to put out our first release. And uh, before that, the UX team kind of stood around, looked at all this work we've done, and felt pretty proud of ourselves and uh, couldn't wait to see what the uh, user responses would be. And a couple days later, we go to iTunes and we check the reviews. And once again, we've got one and a half stars. And that was kind of like a punch in the gut. What was worse, though, that the stars hadn't changed was the tone of the comments. And they were something like this. <laughs> So people were saying, um, it looks better, but this is lipstick on a pig. 
and uh, I've been waiting for two years for my notes sync. Why can't I sync my notes yet? Or why can't I forward meeting invitations yet? Or why are notifications not working properly? So there are very fundamental things that were still not working for them that made their attitude toward these um, updates that we've made um, not very positive. And before this time, even, uh, there had started to be this very um, obvious schism within the user experience team. So we had the people who were primarily focused on making um, cool, innovative, cutting edge apps and people who wanted to fix the problems that we knew were there. And upper management was sort of backing the former half of the team over the latter half of the team. So this, this schism kept growing and we kept kind of making the same mistakes of focusing so much on visual. Um, and after a second release of this, the, the, the half of the team I was on was kind of thoroughly demotivated, having this existential crisis about our field and what are we doing here. Um, we'd had two big redesigns and they were fo focused mostly on visual design. Uh, we were spending far more money, far more effort on what the app looked like than on how it worked and what it did. Um, we were wasting millions of dollars and leaving our users unhappy. And so what some of us realized was that one half of the team was designing for the wrong audience. And some of uh, product management was doing this as well. So what does that mean exactly to design for the wrong audience? There are several ways you can do this, and I'll tell you about um, a few of them that I kind of identified. So the first one is uh, designing for ourselves, and this is also called self-referential design in the design community. And what this consists of is, um, you know, maybe I'm young and I work in Silicon Valley, uh, I always have the latest devices because either I'm going to shell out for them because it's important to me or my employer provides them to me. So I got the Retina display the first time it came out. Um, I'm only going to design for that. Um, I'm going to copy features, icons, etc. from uh, sort of insider apps that a lot of people in the Valley know about and use but that maybe none of my user base knows about. So those things aren't going to be familiar to them. Um, I'm going to use, as Michael Mace was commenting, tiny little fonts that nobody older than me can read. And there's a study that came out in December uh, that said that the average uh, age of the iPhone 5S buyer is 34 years old and the average age of the 5C buyer is 38 years old. So um, some of these average buyers are already starting to have some symptoms of presbyopia where they cannot see up close as well as younger people. Um, we also had uh, product management insist on put pull to refresh into our bread and butter app uh, because all the other apps had it, all the cool apps had it, so we had to have it. Well, our bread and butter app was an always on push email solution where you're not supposed to have to do anything to get your email. And then, you know, some of us were asking, well, what's going to happen on the server side when all these people are start flicking this thing all the time just because they're bored and they have nothing better to do, you know, and the whole thing blew up into a big mess. And, but it, it was a, you know, designing for my peers, I want to be like all the cool kids and have full to refresh in my app. Um, Okay, so another thing about designing for peers, uh, I'll design the most intuitive interactions, the most beautiful animations, and the most unique transitions. So I'll get lots of attention from my peers in the design community, um, maybe without thinking about whether our developers can even code these things, or, or whether our databases can support them, right? I just, it's all kind of about me, and I want to make myself look good to my peers. Um, I'm going to eliminate visual cues because uh, they clutter my design. We actually had a case where um, we had a um, tab bar at the bottom of our app that let you swipe through the different applets. So you could go from email to contacts to calendar, etc. And there was on a second screen um, uh, documents and a browser and preferences. And um, one of the designers who was working on this took out any affordance that, that swipe was available and suddenly we started getting customer calls saying my preferences disappeared. I can't find my browser. And uh, I was actually interviewing the executive assistant who supported our, um, our um, 
chief revenue officer, and she was complaining about how she couldn't adjust this preference in her email, and, and she goes, yeah, it's just gone. And, and I, I kind of waited a minute, and I was like, are you sure? And she said, yeah, it just doesn't exist anymore. So I reached over, and I swiped across the bottom on her phone, and she goes, oh my god, you know, I didn't know that was there. And this person is trying to ch support the chief revenue officer of our company, and she doesn't know that that stuff is there. Be and obviously, she didn't read the tutorial, because there was a little thing in the tutorial. But Another thing you can do is uh, design for the marketing department. <laughs> So, you know, we have this great technology, we need to take advantage of it, we need to do something really slick to show it off. And I don't know if this is where this came from or not, but this is something that has bugged me since the first iPhone. So, uh, you're probably all familiar with the alarm clock, this is something I use several times a week. Um, I did a little test last week just for fun, so I wanted to change my alarm clock by 30 minutes. And I wanted to see how many times it would take me, you know, how many gestures to change it successfully by 30 minutes. And these are the numbers I came up with. Average was 7, high was 11, and the best I got was 4. And I just start thinking, you know, at what point did it become acceptable to require users to swipe 11 times to change the alarm clock by 30 minutes? That's just such a basic thing. To me, this is just the height of arrogance to assume that your users have time to futz with something so basic. Um, we had a fair bit of designing for patents as well. Um, so senior management said, we want things in our patent portfolio that we can horse trade with other companies, start designing some interesting, innovative UI. And what happened was that people designed things that were unique. They were unique because nobody would ever use them. <laughs> <laughs> things that would not make any sense to any user at all got applied for and got patented just because senior management was asking for it. Designing for gatekeepers in the media, um, I can't blame individual designers for this, of course, but um, this happens a lot because everybody wants to be first to market. Um, I know Samsung's Gear Watch, you know, they're, they're trying to get attention in the wearables market, and it's been widely panned, and David Pogue uh, formerly of the New York Times, called it a human interface train wreck. Another example, I know this is a little sensitive, but um, at least the first beta of iOS 7, um, an ex-Apple designer called it, this is iOS as reimagined by a graphic designer, non-obvious, undiscoverable interactions, extremely poor iconography, over helvedicated. And then I don't know how many of you remember this, but the slide to unlock thing, all of a sudden people who'd owned iPhones for years were, couldn't unlock their phone because they kept swiping up instead of sideways. They could not ignore that visual cue down at the bottom. So these are what I call my real people. Um, people who don't work in the valley, people who don't live and breathe technology every day, but people who nevertheless own iPhones, own iPads, etc. To me, they did not ask for all of their familiar icons, buttons, um, UI Chrome to be taken away. Uh, Apple did this to respond to what they perceive as competition from Android and Windows Phone. Um, intuitive gestures are great, but thinking that users will, will learn a whole different set of gestures for your app is, again, arrogant. Um, so vision has been hominids' primary sensory modality for tens of millions of years, and that's not going to change because uh, designers decided for a while that visible controls were clutter. So the promise you make when you put out a product, unless it's for entertainment purposes, unless it's maybe a social app, is here's something that you can get done, uh, things done with, something that will make your life better. Um, to me, putting out something like a Samsung gear is immoral. And um, in case you're interested in more on design morality, um, Mike Montero of Mule Design and Mark Hurst of uh, Creative Good have been doing great talks about this lately, and they're up on Vimeo and stuff. So how can you be sure to design for the right audience? Uh, normally, I would talk about user research because I've spent um, probably half of my UX career as a researcher 
and you can never know enough about your users, obviously. But what I discovered at this last job was that all the research in the world isn't going to help you if you have the wrong designers on staff. Um, they will find a way to ignore or discount the user research because they want to do what they want to do, and they want to work on the sexy stuff, and who can blame them? That stuff is fun. Um, so what I started doing was focusing on skills. Um, there's a great quote from Braden Kovitz of Google Ventures. He says, one designer can illustrate with these, um, while another can barely manage a stick figure. These are both competent UX designers. And there are a lot of people, even in the design community, who don't really understand this quote, who will insist that um, we all know that designers make things pretty, and every job description is going to ask for a Photoshop expert. So there's a diagram I'd like to tell you about, and it was guy, by a guy named Bob Baxley, and he was a designer on Claris Works for a long time, and he's still employed by Apple. And uh, he put out a book called uh, Making the Web Work in the early 2000s, and he, he had a diagram. Um, he's not crazy about pastels. I actually had to just redo this so it would show up better on the screen. But he says there are kind of three major layers and nine sub-layers of user interface. Um, and I'll go through each of them. So the first one is presentation, and it consists of things like text, style, and layout. So these are the things you see um, immediately when you look in an app, and you don't even have to think about it. They just jump right up into your face. So things like colors, typefaces, um, how things are organized on the screen. This is the most highly visible part of any application, and some of you developers may notice that you, you might demo something to a client where you've You've put together some complex thing on the back end, and it worked end to end for the first time, and you're demoing it to the client, and all they can focus on is how they don't like that color of that button over here or whatever. And that's because of this, the prevalence, the, the impact that this visual layer has on people. Then the second layer is behavior. So this is how users interact with an app, and it consists of um, manipulation, controls, displays, how the navigation system works, um, how people view the data in your app, and then any uh, user assistance if you have some. And then the bottom layer, sort of, is structure. So this is conceptual model, task flow, organizational model. And what this means is, um, what is this app? And what does it do? And what other things is it like that I'm already familiar with? Does it sell me something? Is it for getting news? et cetera, um, what tasks can I perform with it, what order can I do them in, um, how well are edge cases handled if they're handled it at all, et cetera. And um, very important uh, layer there, but the thing is that this layer is the one that's most uh, visible to everybody, and it's what everyone sees, so it's what everyone talks about. But this is the one down here where if you don't nail it, um, you might have a beautiful app, but you're never going to have a usable app. It might look fantastic, but people are going to complain about it, even if they don't know exactly what it is they don't like about it. And people who are um, really good at one layer might not be very good at another layer. Like, you might get some overlap between the, the bottom two or the top two, but you're not often going to get someone who's really good at this bottom left corner and really good at this top right corner. Um, and to me, those layers sort of cor correspond to different job descriptions uh, for designers. So you have visual designers who focus on colors, um, layout, typography, things like that. You have interaction designers who focus on how users interact with your app. And then um, you have this sort of architecture layer down at the bottom. And interaction design used to mean the interaction between a system and a human being. And it's sort of evolved in mobile. Uh, down to the interaction between a finger and a screen. And because of that, I think you're going to start seeing new descriptions for something like an architect who, who thinks about all the user flows and, and what order things happen in and, and all that kind of thing because the interaction designers are so focused right now on how the user manipulates the application. Um, so besides skills, another thing I like to look out for is, um, is what I've called temperament. And um, during the split that I mentioned in our team, um, it, there were kind of two sorts of designers that, that came out of it, and I sort of alluded, it to, alluded to it earlier. Um, I hesitate to use this word ego-driven, but I couldn't come up with a better alternative. I tried a bunch of different ones. Um, 
and, and what I mean by this is um, someone who wants to create beautiful things, who loves everything that's new, who wants to set trends or at least follow them very closely, um, and who really wants to be seen as hip and cutting edge. And then the opposite of that is sort of this service-driven person who um, is motiv motivated primarily to solve problems and make people's lives better. Um, and this distinction uh, is valid across all three of those skill types that I mentioned earlier. So you could have an architect, for example, who really wants to use the latest tools, the latest frameworks, the latest whatever, um, even if it doesn't make sense for the project, but they want to be seen as being on the, on the cutting edge. So you'll notice that I use the same photo for both of those types. How do you tell them apart? You can't necessarily look at someone and tell what, you know, what their primary interest is or motivation. And I started asking this simple question during interviews. And it was, um, OK, say you're in your 60s and you're getting ready to retire. And you've had this wonderful career. And you're, um, what sorts of projects would you look back on and be most proud of? And when I listened to their answers, they were very clearly split between these two um, types of responses. So the so-called ego-driven people would say, would talk about cool, beautiful, innovative, cutting-edge things. And the service-driven people would talk about uh, people, problems, motivations, goals, tasks, that kind of thing. And um, I, I tried this on a um, user researcher, actually, and what he told me was that at the end of his career, he wanted to be able to say that he had written a bunch of papers that were quoted by other researchers. And I thought, well, that's fantastic for you, but it doesn't really help us too much with our product. You know, so, so that's been an effective way uh, for me to tell those people apart. And you do need both of these types of people. I'm not trying to promote one. and. Um, disparage another, you need both. Because if you don't have some of those forward-looking, cutting-edge type people, you can wind up with your UI getting dated. Um, you can fall behind your competitors and not thinking about new ways to use the technology. But um, I would not make that the primary um, component of a, a UX team. Or if, if you're, a, you're an indie developer and you're looking to hire someone, you know, think about whether it's you need help thinking through all of the different use cases or um, um, flows for users or whether you need someone to make something pretty. And if you're building a team, definitely you need more of the service-oriented people than you do of the of this sort of style-oriented people. Okay, um, last thoughts. A, a lot of people in the industry say this is a great time for design and right now I would just say this is a great time for designers and um, I think it's not as great at a time for users as it could be. Sure, you can do fantastic things with all these mobile devices, but in a lot of cases, I think um, some of the functionality is either not there or it's maybe not done as well as it could have, especially in enterprise. And as mobile matures, um, I think that real people, like I was talking about earlier, will get better and better at being able to tell whether you made something, whether you made like a labor of love for them, or whether you made something for yourself. <laughs> and I'd like to, for all of us to make sure that um, we aren't turning computing for the rest of us into computing for the best of us. And to me, uh, design is a service industry. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Kinney. I am an Agile delivery manager for Redpoint Technologies. It's a small software consulting firm in Chicago. Um, and my talk is about making the app right, common client misconceptions about mobile projects. So I'd like to tell you a story starting back in 2003, for those of you who were around then, which hopefully a lot of you were. Um, the dot-com boom has bust, but the internet survived. 
and uh, there was a scrappy little startup company that was still doing all right with making websites. And so they had a potential client, think Chicago, big, old school, you know, pork bellies or something company that was thinking about maybe trying out this whole new website thing. So some of the up and coming executives had convinced upper management that this was something they should take a look into, brought the company in to do this pitch. So start talking and go on for a few minutes. And the CEO stops us and goes, hang on, wait a minute. Are you talking about that WWW thing? They're like, yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's just a fad. I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> Needless to say, the meeting went downhill from there. <laughs> Fortunately, most of the misconceptions I'm going to talk to you about today are not that extreme. I'm sure everyone has their crazy horror stories of things that clients that were just way off the deep end. What I'd really like to focus on today is some of the top misconceptions that your clients have when they're starting to do their first mobile project. I'm not talking about people who are familiar with doing mobile apps and have done this before, but somebody who's like, we need to do an app, we want to try this out. Um, and I'd like to give you some thoughts, tips on you know, what some of these misconceptions are, uh, why clients think this way, and what are some things that we can do to try to make things work better. So the first thing is um, we need an app because everybody has one. Now I'm not trying to tell you that every company couldn't use an app, but this is a horrible reason to want to have an app just because everybody else has one. Because really there are only two reasons that people tend to build software for companies. And they both revolve around money. You're either building software to make a company money or you're building it to save them money. It's one of those two things. So that's probably one of the reasons that someone's bringing you in to build an app. But really, if they don't have a purpose, if they don't have a reason for building this app, one, it's going to be impossible for you to understand what they really want, and they're not going to be happy because they don't know what they want. Um, a simple solution is really just to focus on an app statement. Who are the users? Why are they using it? What are they going to do with it? It could be showing them app statements from competitors or just giving them some examples of that. Um, but it's, it's sort of like way back when, when everybody was like, well, we need to get a website. Great. All right, step one, get a website. Step three, profit. <laughs> and nobody would think about that part in between. So I feel like we're a little bit in that space now where everybody's like, we need an app because everybody has one. And it's this big new thing and we have no idea what we're going to do with it. So hopefully those are a couple of little ideas of how to steer clients in that direction of, of understanding why it is that they want this app and what it's going to do rather than just go for it because everybody's got one. Uh, so the next misconception is small screen, small project. It's one of my favorite ones because it sounds so silly and simple, yet people really do believe it. And on the one hand, I can kind of understand it. If you're talking you know, desktop versus this little screen, you can kind of see why they would think it was smaller. But as we all know, that's definitely not the case when it comes to mobile development. So one of the first things that I like to think of is small is relative. You're still going to have all of those different pieces that have to go into software, whether it's something big or something small. And so trying to focus on that. Um, we had a client who had spent two to three years, I think, working on a website that was an internal Facebook-like thing. And we came in and consulted about building them a mobile app, and they wanted to know if we could do it in a month. We said no. <laughs> we did end up working with them, but we said a month was, was not going to happen. Is it going to take two to three years to build their mobile app? Probably not, but it's certainly not going to be as small as they think. Um, another way to help clients understand is talking about the fixed overhead. We've heard a lot about security and privacy today. Um, obviously, those are pieces that have to be in no matter if you're talking big scale project, small scale project, anything in between. Um, and we've heard a little bit about this as well, that when you're looking at usability and things like that, um, there's a lot more to take into consideration with navigation and context. You can have a client who comes in with you know, beautiful shots. That they know exactly what they want. They have all their wireframes worked out every single screen that they want, which is great to be able to start a project with a client that knows that. 
But then when, and this actually happened to us a while back, where when the developers came in and started looking at the transitions between the screens, they realized that there were going to be some serious problems. And so these are things that clients don't always think about, but things um, that it helps to be able to show them that there are other parts to consider. So the next one is the app needs to do everything. And we've heard more about this today as well, where people want to take everything from the big website and just cram it into that big space. Um, but you know what? Mobile apps are really about delighting and engaging our users, and they want something. People want apps because they love their phones. They want, you know, they, they use these phones all the time. They want to do great things with them. They enjoy using them. And so trying to cram all of that usability in one tiny space is just really not the way you want to do it. Um, so a simple question to ask people is, how do you use the device? How do you use your phone? And most people tend to say things like, well, I check email on it. I'll text my wife. I will post pictures of my kids things like that. Um, but most people tend to use their phones in you know, maybe 10 minutes at a time kind of things, doing smaller tasks. And so thinking about that in terms of the usability of the app and what they want to do can sometimes help those clients understand that, say, an, another true example, taking an eight-page registration and putting it on an iPad app is probably not the best way to go, especially when you're trying to be true to your form factor. Um, you know, while we're still talking about a smaller screen, you still have to think about things like how are you going to be able to navigate between things, what does it make sense to do um, between iPhone, iPad, different mobile apps. Um, so thinking about using how you use the device and being true to the form factor um, helps to sort of focus clients in on not trying to cram everything into one app. Um, the next one is that scope, cost, and deadline are non-negotiable. What usually ends up happening with this one is uh, you come into a project where the client knows what they want, and they know when they want it, and they tell you what they're willing to pay for it. And it's usually that last part that's really the sticking point. Because generally speaking, if you know what the scope is and know what the timeline is, you can probably get it done. But more often than not, it's the cost that ends up being the issue. So, of course, the old project management saying is you get to pick two. And you have to figure out which is the one that you're really going to have to give on. Um, obviously, with cost, you know, we've run into clients who say, well, you know, I can get somebody to do it for half that cost. Who can do it in the timeline? We say, OK, that's great. Good luck. And then we see them six months later. And they come back and ask us to fix things, and then it costs twice as much to fix what we could have done in the first place. Um, so there are a couple of ways that we try to mitigate this, and one of them is going through a what we call a discovery phase. It's actually a separate project that we do at the beginning. Um, it's known by another, uh, other names as well. Some people call it an, ex an inception, a sprint zero, a discovery phase. There's lots of different ways to talk about it. But it's really going through with the clients and understanding what it is they want, who's going to be using this app, how are they going to be using it, and going through all those steps and then figuring out all the features, all the pieces. Um, and at the end, you have a readout of all the different things that they want, and you get a realistic estimate and also a realistic budget on it. Um, we had a recent client where at the end of that readout, we realized that the project was literally twice as big that we initially estimated it at. But because the client had been part of that discovery process and understood all the pieces, um, one, they believed us when we said it was going to be twice as big. And while they weren't really happy about that, they could understand where that was coming from. And then they were able to do the next important thing, which is to prioritize. There are a couple different ways that we try to help clients prioritize. The best one is when you can go in and say, all right, here's all the features that you want. What's the most important one? What's the first one you want us to work on? And if things are going really well, they'll be like, oh yeah, this feature. We want this one. Perfect. OK, then what's next? And you go down the line. Um, more often than not, you'll get the client that says, all the features are important. OK, so does that mean that the developers can work on any feature in any order they want? They can just pick and choose, do this one first, that one first. Um, and hopefully, they'll say, no, 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 no. You can't do that. We have to do this one first. Great. But more often than not, they'll be like, yes. It doesn't matter what order you do it in, because we want everything. 
So then you go to plan B, which is, let's imagine it's two weeks before we're supposed to have this app finished. There's one feature that's not going to make it in. What feature do you want to be on that list? And then you work your way backwards from there. Um, but those are a couple of ways that we try to help figure out between all of those pieces, making sure that we can get what the customer wants in the app um, without sacrificing any of those other pieces. So the next thing I want to talk about is I don't need to pay for, I bet people have examples of this. Anybody? I don't need to pay for a designer. Well, we've all heard why design is really important. And I'm not saying that your developers can't do design, because many people do and have. But my question is, is that really the best thing for them to be focusing on? The best thing for you to be spending your money on as a client and your time and effort? Um, do you want the developers developing your app, or do you want them doing the design, which may, not, may or may not be an area of expertise for them? What about this one? I don't need to pay for it. No, no, no. We've got our own QA stuff. We'll QA the app. Well, that's great. You can do the UAT. You can do like the user acceptance testing and make sure it all works from your end. We still have to do the QA on our end because more than likely than not, that QA team does not know anything about mobile. And so uh, it doesn't, I mean, there are lots of different types of testing and you want to have all of them, but having someone say, well, we don't really need you to do the testing because we'll just test it on our end. Uh, never works out well. Then, of course, the last one, I don't need to pay for a project manager. I'm not going to tell you that every mobile project needs a project manager because that's just nonsense. Not everyone does. But every project is going to need project management. And what I mean by that is somebody has to be able to answer the really two big questions. Are we on time? And are we on budget? If no one can answer those questions, you're in really big trouble. <laughs> But more importantly, who's going to be keeping track of those things so that you can answer those, those questions when the client wants to know about them? Do you want that to be your designer? Do you want that to be your testers? Do you want that to be your developers taking their time for doing those things? If you don't have somebody doing the project management on your team, then basically you're asking other people to do it. So you will pay for those things one way or another. So if you're not explicitly paying for a designer, a tester, a project manager, you are implicitly paying for someone else on your team, probably the developers, to do that work. Um, and so trying to expose that. And a lot of clients at first don't like the idea of saying, well, you know, I'm already paying this much for the developers. Why do I have to add in all those pieces? Um, but we, we try to show that this is the way that we do good quality work, and this is the way to get the best results. You can cut corners but it's not going to get you the app that you want. So the next one is we want to cover all the platforms. All of them. And a lot, so there are two different ways this goes, and it depends on whether we're talking about an internal app for a company or an external one. So let's talk about like an internal dashboard style. It's going to be used within the company. And you sit down and they say, okay, we want to do an iOS app, but so we've got Bob. Bob's really important in the company. He has an Android phone. So we want an iOS app, and we want an Android app for Bob. You go, really? You want an Android app? Just, you know that it's going to cost like a lot more just to build a separate app just for the one guy. You could buy him an iPhone every year for a really long time for less than it would cost to build the Android app. And so um, sometimes we'll say, well, can, can we talk to Bob? And kind of explain this to him. And occasionally we get to talk to Bob. And he's like, OK, yeah, I understand. All right, yeah, I, I can live with that. And then sometimes they're like, no, you can't talk to Bob. We can't upset him. We just, we know this is, we know this sounds ludicrous. We know you're, you're looking at us like you can't believe what you're hearing. We just have to do it this way, just build the two apps. And then we go, OK. You know, here's what it's going to cost. And if you're OK with that, and that's what you really want, we'll do that. Um, the other way that you see that, of course, is more for a commercial app. Um, and obviously, that kind of comes down to the whole consumer choice thing. Uh, if you go to the grocery store and, say, go to the toothpaste aisle, 
you see like a whole aisle full of toothpaste, not just one kind, like 20 different kinds that do all these different things. As consumers, we love to have choices. We love to have options. And as a company that does things for consumers, everyone's afraid of taking those options away because they're afraid that they'll pick the wrong option. So you'll definitely see this where people want to cover all the platforms because they're really, really afraid if they don't cover that one platform, they'll lose a bunch of consumers or they'll pick the wrong platform and suddenly everything will be bad. So um, I got a little ahead of myself there, but really focusing on you know, who are your users? Who's going to be using this app and what are they going to be doing with it? Um, we've had some, one client where they really wanted to focus primarily on the iPad app because that was how they knew that their clients were mostly going to be consuming the information. We want most of our money and our budget is going to be spent on the iPad app. We want a bare phones iPhone app as well to complement it, and we need like a little Android app because we have like that small percentage of our people. We know it's going to be a pain, but we really want that other one too. So looking at who are your users, um, and then of course there's the quality versus quantity. If you have X amount of money and time to spend on a project and you're trying to cover a bunch of different platforms, you may not be able to get the quality or you know the as much of an app as you want if you have to split it up versus trying to focus on who are the users and what are they really going to want to see in this app. Along with that, of course, and wanting to cover all the platforms is we don't want to write the app twice. Um, we hear this a lot. We actually, um, at our company, really firmly believe in um, developing on the native platforms. But a lot of budget conscious companies are like, we just don't want to have to write this twice. You know, what about those people? Those groups out there, they say you know, they can write the app once and it's going to work on all of those platforms. <sighs> now, there is, a, there is a place for that, and there are companies where for that works, and that's an acceptable solution. I'm not going to say that there isn't, but um, you know, that's not really how we do it. And another thing is mobile is not one size fits all. Um, we just saw with a bunch of the icons where if you're looking at the icons for um, iPhone versus Android, there are a lot of differences. The usability of them and um, just the way things look, you just can't have the exact same app look the exact same way and work the same way on both devices. So, and then of course there's the don't believe the hype of the, well, we can just do this one thing and it'll work everywhere and it'll be perfect. We, we really try to steer cl clients away from that um, and sometimes they don't listen to us and they go away and do it anyways and then they come back to us six months later and ask us to fix things. So um, next, not a misconception, but something we certainly hear is our services and API work perfectly. Don't believe them. I mean, most of you probably know better, but don't believe them. Assume the worst. Assume it's all in soap. Assume they have. <laughs> and, or if it is in soap, they'll be like, well, we understand this another true story. We understand, you know, you can't do the whole soap thing, but we've got John here, and um, he's going to be able to help you out. And you look at John, and John's like, yeah, yeah, no, don't worry, I have it covered. And hopefully John does know what he's talking about. But <laughs> yeah, so assume the worst, assume it's all on soap, assume it's, and just plan for it. Um, we have started building into a lot of our contracts um, part of this work up front as part of Sprint Zero or some of the initial discovery where just looking at the services and API and making sure that it's not going to cause huge problems later because time after time we've seen this where the client says, no, 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 it's going to be, you know, it's all set, we'll be good. And then when you get to the point where you have to connect with it and then everything just goes wrong. So just assume the worst, if it's, unless they have other apps. If they already have other apps, it's not their first time around the block you can take it with a little bit less of a grain of salt. But assume that if they've never done a mobile app before that there's going to be a lot of problems with this and um, just plan for it. Then we have this one. Mobile apps are fire and forget. I think a lot of this comes from people want, they just want to get it done. They're like, we want this mobile app, we want to get it done. We get it in the app store, you know, Apple accepts, it's all great, we're going to celebrate, we're done. But you want it done or you want it done right? We heard a lot of talk yesterday about um, iterating. 
And it can be, often be hard to convince clients to do an MVP, to start small and work on adding features. Um, but sometimes it makes a lot more sense when you're talking about somebody who's only got a smaller budget. Start with the core features. Let's do what you can now in the six months. We want to do another refresh. We'll add some more features on. Work it um, that way. Um, so that's one way to do it. And then, of course, you know, it's obvious to us, you're always going to need updates. Um, I can't think of any better visual way to show a client than this, than showing them the difference um, between the old iOS and iOS 7. I mean, that's the best picture I think you can paint. And even for Android, you still get a lot of updates on that. And so just helping clients understand that it's never just going to be a fire and forget. You're always going to have to keep updating. So a couple of closing thoughts. Why, why do clients think these things? Um, it's not that the clients are out to get us or they're trying to make life difficult or give us headaches. I think there are a couple of big reasons why. One is just lack of understanding. If they've never worked in the mobile space, if they're used to web, um, it's just a very different way of developing. Things that are easier, I mean, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but things that are easy on the web are hard on mobile and vice versa. And so for people who don't have that experience, it's just really hard for people to understand. So it's just a lack of understanding. Um, another can be a lack of communication. No one's ever tried to walk someone through and explain, no, here are the pieces and here's why it's going to take six months, not six weeks, to develop your app. And so that's another part. And sometimes it's just different priorities. Um, as app makers and developers, we want to make sure that we have the highest quality work and that we're putting out really great products. And when you put that up against a CEO who has a deadline and wants to get something out really quickly because there's a big event or something coming up, um, it creates some of these problems because you know, you'll, you'll have clients who just want to say, no, we're just get it done. Just get it done, don't worry about it. We, you know, we'll, we'll fix all the bugs later. We just want to ship it and get it out there. And so it's different priorities and trying to manage those um, that can be a challenge. But I think the thing to remember when you're working with clients and trying to deal with all of the issues with them is to know that we all have the same thing in common, is that we all want to make a great app. And so if that's your focus in making a great app and helping your client understand how to do that, and doing the best you can to work with them to make sure that you can do that, um, that you will be successful. So that's the end. All right, so um, we have a few minutes for questions, so uh, we'll bring both of our panelists up. And um, any questions from the crowd? Do we have anyone who wants to ask about how to make the right app, how to uh, make the app launch, make sure it launches? So here's a, here's a question that I, I um, have. What do you do when, um, usually near the end of this process, someone who outranks everyone on the team comes to the team and says, hi, I, I, I really want this feature, or I think this color is wrong, or I want a complete redesign, because I think this is all in the wrong, going in the wrong direction. How do you handle that? Oh, that's a fun one. <laughs> that, that's always a fun one, isn't it? So there are a couple ways to look at it. Usually when we've been working really closely with the client, hopefully we've been working with the decision makers as well. And so we can show them things like, well, if you want this new feature in, all these other things are now taken out. It's not like you want one new thing and we're going to do that plus the other 10 things that you wanted. Um, if you're going to put new things in, you have to take other things out. It's about balancing those priorities. I mean, if it's switching a color, we can probably do that. Um, and obviously sometimes if it's, um, something where they're like, no, 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 really, we just have to do all of this. Sometimes the price changes, sometimes the timeline changes. Um, you know, you try to accommodate what your client wants, but at the same time, not at the cost of, you know, killing your developers or creating a bad product. So it's, it's always a balancing situation. Questions from the crowd? Hi there. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, I'm coming we were, we're working in a finance industry. Could you speak uh, up a little bit? Sorry, we're working in a big finance in industry uh, with big banks, large institutions, and I'm just wondering from a design perspective, uh, is it reasonable to expect to delight users with, with what you feel is great design? Um, like, what are your thoughts on trying to challenge 
um, all traditional schools of thought and is it worth trying to like help uh, your users care about design like when all they when all they know is functionality uh, is it worth trying to show them form is also important I'm sorry is it worth trying to show them what form like design and like form. great experience is just as important I, I think as long as you've got your bases covered on functionality you know if it does the things that they need it to do and it does them in an easy way then you can you can add nice design elements you can you know what I mean you can take care of that um, as well but you, you if you try to give something that's very flashy and attractive without covering your bases with regard to functionality and usability um, you're not going to make them happy does that answer your question uh, for the most part but it really comes down to is it you know is it worth trying to do that like w w the backlash you might receive or if if they're no it has to be this way that is that is something that we want to try and do and push the boundaries of or is it just you know this is what they expect this is what we should give them um, cover their expectations first and then if you want to add to that and, and make it maybe prettier than it needs to be or more elegant or um, stylish than it needs to be you can do that um, it just depends kind of what your charter is you know what's the what's the product definition is it part of your competitive advantage to be slicker than the competition I would ask those questions. I would add one thing to that too, is that um, clients don't always know what they want. Big surprise there, but um, they think they know what they want, but they don't always know what they want. And so not going too far outside what they're expecting, but sometimes giving them options that are slightly different than what they asked for, just to give them some choice. Sometimes it's, you don't know what you want until you see it, or giving them a choice that's actually very different so that they can really hate that and then really like the other things. <laughs> that's another way to look at it. But some, I mean, you see this all the time and people when they're trying to sell you something, they'll bring out something that's totally different than what you asked for, just to gauge your reaction and to get more feedback. Because sometimes you'll get more, a better understanding of what clients want based on negative feedback than positive. You, know, you show them a, a screenshot, they're like, oh yeah, that looks good. Okay, that's fine. But you might show them something different like, oh, that's awful. I hate that color. Move this thing here. So sometimes you can get more out of negative feedback than positive. Obviously, you want to make sure you're making your clients happy and you're, you are giving them what they want. But sometimes having a couple of those options out there can help them make those decisions. Yes. I'm just wondering uh, if you have any tips for working with clients who are not the eventual users of the app, uh, as well as what if your client has a different workflow? For instance, if they follow the waterfall and they expect you to follow the same schedule, do you have any tips for those? Thanks. Yeah, so working with clients where um, the users are not, the end users are not your client. Um, so let's say it's a client who is working in the financial industry and they're making a banking app for someone. Um, hopefully you're working with a client who knows their users well or you can either get more information on how the users are going to be using that, user testing. Um, there are a lot of different ways to go about it. One of the things we try to do with the discovery phase is look at um, who are the different user personas who might be using the app, how would they use it, what steps would they be taking, what would their workflows be to get a better understanding of um, what all those pieces might be. And the other part about working with clients who say do waterfall, um, we do agile, but it's sort of pragmatic agile where there are some places where we're willing to give a little more and some places where you know, if the client wants things a certain way, we'll do it, but there are other tenants of agile that we stick to pretty closely. And we tell clients that up front. So it's not like, okay, we're going in and we're doing scrum by the book and you have to do everything exactly this way. If a client wants that, we'll do it. Um, but we try to expose up front that this is how we work. We work in sprints. Um, we try to get you know, frequent feedback from them and things like that. So we try to make it clear from the beginning that that's part of what we do, but there are definitely places where we're willing to kind of give and take depending on uh, what works well with the client. And if a client's like, no, we want to do exact waterfall, big design up front, we want to know everything from the beginning, you know, that's a client we may just not take on because it's not worth it because it's not going to work well for how we make software. 
All right, so um, one last thought to leave the crowd with. Um, what do you want to tell everyone about working with project managers and designers? So I think most of the crowd are developers, or a lot of it. So what's your, what's your kind of hint? One thing to leave, quick, quick thing to leave everybody with. Um, I guess I would just repeat um, what I said earlier was to, uh, know what you need out of your designer and that not every designer um, does Photoshop and not every de designer does task flows. You know, you, you need to know what your weaknesses are and, and what you really need to focus on and so that you can get the right person uh, who will do a great job for you. Um, and I would say for project managers, I know that everyone's probably worked with a bad project manager, <laughs> but a good project manager can make your project go much more smoothly and make life a lot better, at least in my experience. Um, so project managers are not there to tell you how to do your job. They're there to help understand what you're doing and to communicate that to the client, to be that interface. You know, take the specs from the designers and take them over here, you know, with people skills. Sorry, office space reference. Um, so it's, I, I think part of it is being able to, t to you know, what, what I'm here for is one, to take away problems and distractions and, and issues with clients. Like, the client won't get back to us and tell us what color the screen's supposed to be. All right, I'll take care of that. Or helping to explain to the client, well, I know we said that we were going to get this feature done this week, but it turns out that it's twice as difficult as we thought. And so taking that from, you know, the technical aspects of why it's more complicated and what's going on with that and trying to make sure that the clients can kind of understand it in more layman's terms. So I guess that's what I would say.